My name is Fan Zhang, coming from Zhejiang University, China. This is a joint work with many institutions, including DAS, NTU, NUAA, and SJTU. Let's start with an introduction. Fort Attack was first proposed by Dan Bonnet in 1996. It is an active attack and had two stages the online fault injection stage and the offline fault analysis stage. The pair of correct and faulty ciphertexts can be used to explore the secret key. The adversaries need some equipment to generate non-invasive, semi-invasive, and invasive injections. Possible injection methods can be clock glitch, voltage glitch, EMFI, and laser FI. Most of the injections that are studied are actually non-invasive attacks. When we talk about the fault attacks, we need to address the so-called fault model, such as the fault width and the fault type. Also, we need to address the fault location and the time. Fault location means in which byte or nibble the fault is injected. And the timing means in which round and which operation that the fault is injected. Those who experienced with the real experiment of the fault attacks, you will know that it actually requires a very precise timing control. Most of the faults are transient, it means a, a short time. In CHESS 2018, we propose a new type called the persistent fault, which can last for a couple of rounds or encryptions. Persistent fault attack, in short PFA, is to solve this problem of synchronization. Since the fault persists during the encryptions, it can be injected before the encryption starts, and it doesn't require a precise timing. A typical persistent fault for AES can be injected by modifying its S-box and then the key can be easily recovered with the statistics of the ciphertext. In that paper, faults are injected into S-Box with the technique of low hammer on AES software implementation. However, at that moment, we didn't know whether such analysis can be applied in a traditional fault attack scenario, such as laser injections. In this paper, we conducted a persistent fault attack on an 8 mic microcontroller, a very typical target of classic fault attacks. To make the attack more practical and much easier, we improve our method in several ways. First, we utilize the maximum likelihood estimation to reduce the number of ciphertexts that is required. Second, we propose a method to verify whether the desired position fault is injected. Third, we improve the analysis technique to handle the cases when the fault in an S-box is unknown. Along with the, these improvements, we extend the PFA to the lightweight block cipher present. And finally, our attack is verified through a laser-based fault attack. So we go, for, go over the PFA on AES first. We re-emphasize the fault model first. We assume the adversary can inject faults before the increase of a block cipher. He prepared an environment with the inject faults and then asked the victim to start the encryption. Second, the inject fault is positioned for multiple encryptions. Third, the adversary is capable of collecting multiple ciphertext outputs. The watchdog counter is not considered in this case. 
The core idea of a persistent fault test is that the previous tightly coupled fault injection stage is now partitioned into two stages, the loose coupled fault injection stage and the subsequent increasing stage. In total, we have three stages in for now. The interesting part of PFA is that the fault is a persistent in the S-box. However, the faulty element of S-box, for example, 61 marked in red in this figure, may not be accessed. Some, some self-tags are correct and some are incorrect. So how we do the simple position fault analysis? Suppose the correct element is V. After the fault injection, the value becomes V star, which is erroneous. For a specific ciphertext byte, V star will appear twice, and you will never see the original V. The distribution of the values of the ciphertext byte is now becoming biased. V star is with a probability of 2 over 256, and V is with a probability of 0. The adversary can exploit three types of fault injection for the leakages for the zero probability and for the maximum probability he can directly know the key for other probabilities he can still get some impossible values of the key and reduce the key search space by the way the values of v and v star are known to the adversary here is an illustration of the analysis result. Quite straightforward. Like the figures in DPA and the CPA, we plot the probability of values for ciphertext bytes along with the number of samples. If you see the red curve, which is all zero, you know the value of V. If you see the blue curve, with the, which converges to a to two, 2 over the 256, you know the values of V star. So that is the core idea of original PFA. With enough number of ciphertexts, the red curve can be easily detected. In this paper, we want to reduce the total number of ciphertexts that is required to find the red curve. The problem is that when the number of ciphertext is not enough, for example, showing the green box, there will be multiple values correspond to the red curve with a zero probability. That means the red curve will have multiple candidates. To find the best candidates among them, we need a metric to compare these candidates. The metric is based on the fact that the red curve is bound to a fixed blue curve given the fault in S-box. Since the blue curve should have a, a higher frequency, the candidate whose corresponding blue, value, blue curve has the maximum probability will be chosen as the estimation of the red curve. Actually, what we did is equivalent to a statistic method called maximum likelihood estimation, in short, MLE. MLE is a method of estimating parameters by maximizing the probability of a given observation. In our contest, the parameter to be estimated is the red curve, and the given observation is our collect ciphertext. And the estimation of the red curve can be performed with those equations at the bottom of this slide. The result shows that with the technique of MLE, the total number of ciphertexts for the red curve can be reduced to 72%, compared with the original paper in CHESS 2018 equivalently 28% less. Next, we will explain the practical problems of PFA.
For real attack, we need to solve two main problems in practice. One is that the adversary may need to try for several times to inject a desired fault into the device. So he needs to know whether the fault is really injected or not. The other problem is that it is difficult for the adversary to know which element of the Xbox is cracked and how it is changed. Therefore, before conducting a practical PFA, he had to recover these unknown parameters first, including the photo location and the photo value. So how to identify the effective injections? For AES, the Xbox is accessed 106 times during the encryption. With a 40 Xbox, the probability for a ciphertext to become 40 is calculated to be 53%. That means, if the, our injection is effective, about half of the subtests will become 40. However, the principle we judge an injection to be effective is whether both correct and 40 subtests exist. This is the key point. We do not require the ratio to be 53%. There could be some misjudgment and we find that with 20 subtext, this misjudgment rate will become very, very small. And how to find the fault value f? For the recovery of fault value f, the basic idea is quite straightforward. When sufficient ciphertext, uh, f can be recovered by XOR, the blue curve, and the red curve in this figure. With insufficient ciphertext, these two curves are not that distinguishable. So we utilize MLE to recover the F in this case. Next, uh, how to recover the, the, the fault of index I? Uh, this is sort of uh, complicated, so please read our paper. But the key point here is that if the fault index is unknown, the adversary has to either to do an exhaustive search or to find a tricky way. To find the correct fault index through the 256 candidates, the trick is that for the correct i, the original value of the fault element will never appear in the output of Xbox. And this property holds for all the Xboxes in all rounds. With this metric, the fault index i can be easily recovered with hundreds of ciphertext, and the misjudgment rate is still very low. In the next part, we will show the PFA on the present cipher. Present is a lightweight SPN block cipher. It uses a 4-bit S-box. It has a key size of 80 bits and a block size of 64 bits. To adopt PFA to, to present, we need to solve two additional problems. First, it uses a 4-bit S-box. So if the S-box is corrupted, all the ciphertext will be wrong. There will not exist a case that half are correct and half are 40. So we need a new method for identifying effective injections for present. Second, the length of the mask key is longer than the run key, and the PFA can only recover the last run key. So additional analysis is required to recover the remaining Bits. Since the Xbox only has 16 output values, and one of them will disappear if the injection is effective, we can collect some self-checks to see if there are only 15 output values. 
If yes, we believe that the injection is effective, or quite simple. Similarly, there could be some misjudgment, but the rate is proved to be very, very low. The recovery of the additional 16 qubits, which can be done in two steps. In the first step, we analyze the last round to recover the last round key and the photo value f and the photo index i. And in the second step, we trace back for one more round to recover the full key. The attack on the last round is basically the same as that on AES. The number of samples that is required is quite small due to the lightweight feature of present. Roughly 25 and 98 ciphertexts are enough for recovering F and C mean, respectively. Due to the time limit, I skip this slide, uh, which basically uh, explains how to attack, do the attack uh, to the last round, last but round, one round. And the final results show that for a full attack on present, only about uh, one or two ciphertexts are required. Uh, next, we will verify our analysis through a practical laser photo attack. And we found some interesting observations for laser injections on SRAM. The victim device is an 8 mag microcontroller. It is decapped on the backside to allow the laser injection. And we use a high resolution camera to take a photo for details inside. The main, the main components are labeled in this figure. And we can see the I.O., the flash, and the logic. Uh, one of the major contributions of this paper is that we identify that the target of PFA could be the SRAM. And uh, we do put this point into the practice. We set up the whole system and shoot the laser into the S-Box, which is loaded from the flash when the microcontroller powers on. We automatically scan the S-Run area with the laser pulses. To reproduce the work, we mark the reference point, the start and the end, the end point. Uh, the step size is about uh, 5 micrometer in both X and Y directions. Uh, honestly, uh, this is a very tedious yet time-consuming part. Um, we, we injected a total of uh, 55,000 laser pulses and found 4,000 bit flips. Uh, as shown in this figure, the S-Box and its inverse occupied the half of the SRAM. And we also deploy the present S-Box, which is only 16 bytes, and attached at the end of AES S-Box. With this experimental data, we can find the mapping between the logic address and the physical location. This mapping shows that in this SRA, each row contains 8 bytes of data, and these 8 bytes are arranged by bits rather than by bytes. For example, 8 MSB bits from different bytes are grouped into one row instead of putting 8 bits together. Finally is the conclusion. In this paper, we improved the PFA to make it more efficient and practical.
it requires 28% ciphertext less than the original PFA, and it can utilize unknown fault in Xbox. Um, to demonstrate that our attack is quite general, we extended the PFA to the present cipher. Finally, we tested our attacks with practical laser injections, and we found some interesting characteristics of the SRM. So uh, that's it. Thank you very much.